Welcome to your daily five minutes of faith. This is Bonefire episode 16, the Pentateuch. I'm Dr. Kevin T. Goddard. In this episode, I will introduce the Pentateuch and explain what, what it is and the story it tells. I will repeat key concepts several different ways since the Pentateuch is rich, exciting, and rewarding when properly understood. In the first 15 episodes, we learned that the Old Testament introduces us to God, His nature, His character, His promises, His chosen people, and His plan for redeeming mankind to Himself. God commands us to listen to His words, live by them, which He will do for us by writing them on our hearts. The Pentateuch is the beginning of God's word from the moment of creation to Moses' death. It consists of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Originally, these five books were simply known as one book called Torah, often referred to as the Book of Moses, Book of the Law, or simply Book. Torah is referred to in numerous places in the rest of the exilic and post-exilic books of the Bible. Jesus even refers to the Book of Moses in Mark 12:26 making it clear Jesus recognized the canon of Jewish scripture known to us as the Old Testament up to that point in time. The word Pentateuch means five scrolls and Torah means instruction. The Israelites would have understood the use of the term law in Torah to mean a guide to life for those obedient to a covenant with their king or ruler. God's law was a gift to his people to preserve life not to cause hardship or bring death. God's law with Adam was simple because Adam walked with God in the Garden of Eden and understood what God was like. So God's only law was that Adam recognize and submit to God's sovereignty by obeying one command. Since Adam couldn't keep even that simple command, Adam severed mankind's right relationship with God. The result is God creating a path for the restoration of mankind's relationship through a future Redeemer. The Pentateuch lays the foundation of this story by defining God as a sovereign creator who intended man to have a personal relationship with him. Man introduced sin into the world by corrupting his relationship with God. Sin, therefore, is defined through man's relationship with God. Because the Pentateuch covers so much time and crucial information for God's people, the narrative moves between pivotal moments in God's working in history to long genealogies that show the continuation of God's promises from Adam to Jesus. God used his promises to Israel and the tribes he gave specific land rights and and civil and ceremonial roles to create the need for strict genealogical record keeping in the temple. These records establish the proof necessary to prove Jesus' rightful place as the king of Israel through Mary, his bloodline to King David, his succession to the throne through Joseph of the royal house of King David, and through his claims to be the son of God, the God-man, proven by his resurrection from the dead, after serving as the final and ultimate ceremonial sacrifice to atone for the sins of not just Israel, but all of his people. I am guilty of skipping through the genealogies too, but they are an essential part of God's word to his people, proving his faithfulness through all of the times God's people abandoned him and his law. While there are some great stories in the Pentateuch, the primary purpose is for God to reveal who he is to his people and establish a covenant with them as to how they are to honor him as he sends a redeemer and restores the right relationship between him and his people broken by man's sinfulness. This story begins with the creation in Genesis, the fall of Adam, the promise of a redeemer, the population of the world, and man's continual descent deeper and deeper into sin. It flows through the destruction of the world by the flood and promises to Noah and then Abraham. In Exodus, we see Israel enslaved by Egypt and then delivered by God through his servant Moses. At Israel's first stop, Moses goes to get God's moral law for 40 days, only to return and find the Israelites already returning to the idolatry of Egypt. Leviticus and Numbers relate God's requirements for Israel to live in covenantal relationship with him as he fulfills his promises to Adam and Abraham. When Israel gets to the land God had promised them, they refuse to rely on God and go in and conquer the people living there. 
God sends them back into the wilderness for 40 years so that the generation that came out of Egypt with idolatry and pagan lifestyles would die off and the next generation would only know God, his provision, and his faithfulness as he provided everything they needed. In Deuteronomy, we read the conclusion of this journey as Moses brings the people to their promised land. The story ends with Moses prohibited from entering because of disobeying God, but God allows Moses to look into the land. The people cross the Jordan to take the land and Moses dies. Each figure that arises in the Pentateuch and the rest of the Old Testament to deliver God's people might be the promised Messiah only to fall short as God demonstrates that only he can be the true and perfect Messiah he has promised all along. So through all of this, what does God reveal about himself to us? God is expressed in what he does and who he is. God defines himself to us. We do not define God for ourselves. His first act reveals him as the creator in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created from nothing, ex nihilo, to distinguish himself from his creation. God's will alone set all of creation in motion to fulfill his plans and purposes. God created man as the highest form of creation, made in the image of God to obey God's command to help care for the earth. Adam promptly disobeys God by deciding for himself what is good and bad, breaking man's relationship with God, casting all of mankind into willful ignorance of who God really is. This willful refusal to acknowledge God's rightful sovereignty over mankind is sin. Every person ever born, except Christ, has this trait passed down to them genetically and spiritually through Adam, so they will willfully live enslaved to sin, dying physically and spiritually from the moment of birth, unless Christ calls them to himself by the Holy Spirit. In Exodus and Deuteronomy, God shows that he is God of gods and Lord of lords. By freeing his chosen people, Israel, from the slavery of Egypt into the wilderness, where he proves his sovereignty by using man's sinful choices to accomplish his purposes, by providing for all of their needs to make them dependent on him, and by establishing his rule as their true king, by pronouncing commandments, decrees, and statutes over them. In these books, he also proves that he is a personal God, a loving father developing relationship with his adopted children, protecting them. The Pentateuch provides a picture of the God of the Israelites unique from and above the gods of all other nations and maps the path God created to restore relationship with his children. He is the only true God, creator of everything, sovereign over all, loving father to and jealous possessor and protector of his chosen people, redeemer who restores fellowship with his chosen, and judge who necessarily complements his love for submission and repentance with wrath and punishment for disobedience. Because God and his will are perfect and unchanging, by his mercy and grace, God makes steadfast and faithful covenants with his chosen people. He promises to create a path to restored relationship and life through a temporary sacrificial system that is fulfilled by his providing a worthy ultimate sacrifice in the person of God incarnate, Jesus Christ. In response to this promise, God's people respond with loyalty and obedience to him and his lessons on holy versus unholy, clean and unclean, sin and righteousness, trying to live lives pleasing to God, grateful for God's mercy and grace at their inability to live perfect lives for him, demonstrated time and again in scripture by providing continual atonement through the sacrifice of the coming Messiah. And just as we see God without a temple as Israel travels through the wilderness toward his promised land, Christ provides the last and ultimate sacrifice for the sin of his chosen people so that God the Spirit moves from a physical temple into the hearts of his people as they make the journey to the new promised land, eternal life. Moses writes the history of God's faithfulness to his people and demonstrates the nat nature of his character in the book of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, so that God's children will submit and obey. The Pentateuch becomes the measure by which the rest of Scripture must be faithful to 
unerringly support and precisely fulfill in order to be included in the canon of 66 books we recognize as the infallible, inerrant, sufficient word breathed out by God through human authors called the Bible.